without further ado, I'll just um, introduce our panel members. And uh, uh, Lloyd has actually already kindly already introduced a few of them already for you, but I'll give you a little bit more background information. So um, representing our gold sponsor tonight, we have Alex Fraser. Alex, could you please um, step up and join the panel? Thank you. So um, Alex is the director of um, Hanrick Curran. Alex brings more than 35 years of experience in accounting. Alex and the team at Hanrick Curran pride themselves on being more than just an accounting uh, company. They are strategic partners in business. Thank you. Then we have Graham Packer. Graham, would you mind stepping up and joining the panel, please? Thank you. So Graham has joined us tonight to represent family business. Graham is the, in, is the international marketing director of Packer Leather, and it, which is a fifth generation family business which has survived and thrived since starting in 1891. Lindy Chen. Lindy, would you mind stepping up, please? So Lindy is the director and founder of China Direct Sourcing and China Direct Investment. Lindy truly is the modern superwoman. As well as running her own business, um, Lindy sits on several boards. She is an author and has recently been elected as president of the Sunnybank Chamber of Commerce. And finally, we have Campbell Newman. So most of us, as you know, would know Campbell as the politician. However, tonight, Campbell joins us to share his insights as a business owner and board director. And as we discovered this morning, there will be a little bit of political agenda in there as well. <laughs> Thank you. You were not going to get away with not having questions. So... Ladies and gentlemen, it is now over to you. You've uh, taken a lot of time out of, your, out, out of your evening. It's a Thursday night. Everyone's got to go to work tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to hand it over to you to actually ask the panel some fairly... any sort of question you want re regarding the governance and, and the talk that you've had presented tonight. Uh, and from your perspective, so if you're a third generation business or fifth generation business or second generation business or a start-up business and you've had this thing called governance or go and get a board jammed down your neck, uh, certainly ask the questions of the panel. So I'm over to you now. Is there a microphone? Yes. The microphone behind you, Sue. Evening. My name is Mike Avey. I'm a CEO of Brisbane Angels. Um, I've had a, a fairly long history with uh, startup, early stage companies, uh, some family businesses, and uh, chaired a couple of uh, public unlisted companies. But uh, what I'd like to do is uh, ask question a question of Peter, and, and perhaps take the liberty of posing some of the answer to that. And, and that's, Even better. <laughs> well, see whether people agree. Uh, it seems to me from what you've said, Peter, that the, uh, the role of the board to, is to concentrate on strategy. And to my mind, that, what that means is that the, the role of the independent director should change. And this is where the answer comes in. To, to my mind, what that means is that the independent director should be there to actually question very deeply the role of the executive directors to make sure that that's exactly what they're doing. <coughs> okay. So number one, uh, there's no distinction in law between any directors. So I think we need to acknowledge that. Yep. Uh, but yeah, you're, a you're absolutely right. Uh, the assumptions that we bring into the boardroom, whether we're coming in as an executive or a non-executive or an independent, those assumptions will be quite different. Uh, certainly when I'm coming in as a non-executive or independent, uh, I see it as my agenda to do exactly what you've just described. Uh, to test the assumptions, to work with the chair, uh, to make sure that we are digging in fully and well, uh, because as directors we've got a duty of care to make sure that we understand what it is we need to understand to make an informed decision. And if we're not ready to do that, then we should keep asking questions. Thank you. We hear this... this politically correct thing called, we do have to have board diversity. Um, and white Caucasian males over 50, of which I'm one, diversity isn't something that, that we're actually put into that area of. Uh, we've, got some, we've got some 
people here that are from women on boards and, uh, and from the government area in, in, in that women area. But your guys, we've got quite a different set of experiences than that long here. Could you give a, a quick one minute pricey on, on, on your idea of diversity and how that adds value to the business? I guess uh, the, the, the concept of diversity for the sake of diversity is um, as, as distinct from meritocracy is not something I necessarily agree with because if you're looking at sort of the contribution to say the shareholders and you're simply saying I'm going to select somebody because they're you know, male, female, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whereas a, a better candidate uh, may not necessarily fit the profile you're trying to fill. Uh, then I think you're doing the disservice to the shareholders. So, um, yes, uh, diversity has a place, but meritocracy has a better place. Family businesses are unique in their own own way because of the shareholding that's held mostly, and often uh, in the past, uh, females have not been involved in the business too much. So that's a changing game out there now. My other boards that I work on, you know, they're not-for-profit boards, school boards, yes, there are females in there. And that's, and that's great to have because you need another perspective at time because you're dealing with young people of either sex. Our family business, um, it's a, a work in progress, doing, doing boards properly, doing them carefully and professionalising what you do. And as the years go by, 40 years ago, when we relocated our business, it wasn't a big deal. But today it is a big deal. And that's where you need the, the wider variety of people are. Um, in my view, uh, the diversity is good, it's important, but it's not the number one uh, things I would consider uh, from the board point of view. Uh, it would more so uh, as a board member to coming from the core value. Uh, what was the core value uh, the uh, board member would um, have? And is that aligned with the company's vision, company's purpose? And does that really fit in where the company want to go? And once that first priority has been met, and then we would consider, well, preferably something fit that profile um, could be a woman or could be this, could be that, would be better, but doesn't have to be that way. Um, that's what I thought diversity come as a second priority. Well, look, I've always believed in um, having a diverse range of people in the boardroom, and it could have been a cabinet or a city cabinet, a civic cabinet of Brisbane City Council. I've always believed in having a diverse group of people um, with quite different viewpoints and indeed characters and, and personality types, because um, when you've got sort of a monoculture, you've got groupthink. Um, particularly when you've just got a group of blokes in the room, they have got a particular way of approaching problem solving and particularly crisis management, and they do some silly things. And I've always enjoyed particularly having strong women in the room who can quickly change the whole perspective in the debate and actually stop the men driving the train over the, over the cliff. And, and literally, I, I do mean that. Having said that, the sort of the debate that's out there in the media on this issue, I'm afraid, um, is in danger of derailing at times the, the, the real um, primary objective of the company, which is actually to go and um, you know, um, make profits for shareholders. So my, my conclusion is that any group of people who are intent on the, the long-term future and, uh, of a company and the, 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 the fulfilment of objectives for stakeholders should have a diverse, balanced board. However, what concerns me is when they are being distracted and besieged with calls to do all sorts of uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility things, that take them away from making profits for shareholders. And that is a bigger worry, if you ask me, uh, at the moment, because our companies are not performing as strongly as they need to in a challenging environment. Um, I don't think I disagree with anything that's been said here. Uh, the research shows quite clearly that women on boards can be helpful, and different research shows that women on board is neutral, 
and different research shows that woman on board is distractive to performance. So the answer is, we don't know. Directly, directly. However, I'm an absolute advocate, as Campbell and others, by putting the right mix of people in the room, a diverse set of views. If I hold up a cup, and you can see that cup with the handle out like this, you're all going to see that cup, and you're all going to describe that cup in a similar way. You're all going to have the same biases, and you're all going to have the same opinions. But if we get somebody around here, like Alex, looking at the cup, he's not going to see the handle. So he's going to see something quite different, and he's going to describe it quite differently. And that's the simplest and most direct way that I can describe the value of diversity in the boardroom, of women specifically. What I have seen is when you put, and one is not enough, when you put two women in the boardroom, I have seen the conversation becomes more civil, that plays to your comment, uh, the commitment to read the board papers and be more engaged goes north, and the commitment to action and to hold the chief, uh, chief executive accountable improves as well. None of that is specifically and directly to performance of the company, but all of it is useful for a board being more effective. So very comfortable with all of that in place. But let's not say that just because I've got a red car and you've got a blue car, that my car inherently goes faster. It's how I drive it. A whole lot of women lining up there. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, Anne Houston, Integral Management Services. Um, I'm interested in each of your views on uh, strat strategy, uh, the time frames that you're thinking about. You mentioned uh, four strategic um, initiatives in what you were talking about, Peter. Um, there's different ways of doing that. I just wanted to understand your different opinions on that, please. Can I go last? You go and go down that way and I'll cover off. Okay. Oh, well, I believe that the whole uh, thing about the time spent on strategy that Peter talked about is just becoming incredibly important at the moment because of the tidal wave of disruptive change that's coming towards us. When I left politics, I found a, a report by McKinsey done about three years ago which described 12 or 15 of these disruptive technologies and changes. So... The Internet of Things, advanced gas and uh, oil technology, mm. uh, advanced robotics, nanotechnology, I think these are the sorts of things. And I deliberately planted myself in a variety of those, those areas. Um, the point is that there are businesses today who are not, they're not going to be in business in 15 years' time. Uh, an example I gave this morning at the breakfast was um, I'm involved um, in commercial property investment. So let's just take an example. If you go and buy a petrol station today, is it going to be a petrol station in 15 years' time when it might have to be a battery recharging station for electric cars? Or maybe the cars will be so sophistic sophisticated we won't need petrol stations. Do, do you see where I'm going? The final point on the subject is that I saw an article the other day. There are 5 million professional truck drivers supposedly in the United States of America. There are three million people who support those truck drivers who make the sandwiches, the milkshakes, the burgers, and probably a whole range of other services. This particular article was suggesting, due to autonomous vehicles coming in, that in 15 years' time, there's five million people and maybe another three million who support them who don't have jobs. So strategy and consideration of this changing environment, I'm sorry for my long answer, is just so much more important than it was, say, 20 years ago, because the environment and the pace of change is just changing so quickly now. And you may not have a business, or your business may have to be radically different. Um, from my point of view, uh, one thing I uh, often come across, especially dealing with a lot of our clients, the number one thing, uh, one thing we do is helping a lot of our clients to go to China, and also entering into China market. So sitting on the board, one of the first thing I would ask is what is your strategic plan? And what would be the view? And China is so huge, and you can't take over the whole China. 
and what would be, you know, uh, like uh, your starting point, where you want to head in, and what is the direction where you really want to go to. And those conversations not only happen once, but actually happen quite often. Whenever we had a meeting, we would go back to review those questions. Otherwise, sometimes you get lost in the whole just, the, you know, day-to-day -day running things. And or sometimes when you talk to the board and you as the um, like uh, sit in the, the meeting and if you don't ask those things and people just start to talk about the, the daily management things. And so in my view, <clears throat> to have that as an agenda and as a part of the board meeting and uh, to cape for what's happening uh, in the new market is quite important. Not only that, giving you an example, um, today I was sharing with many people about a new upcoming new thing it's called WeChat um, uh, in China. This is so popular. Basically, if you go to China, you want to uh, market in China, you got to have WeChat. If you don't have it, and you miss out. And uh, so, uh, as any particular, um, I was sitting on the board with other companies, and uh, you know, like this Oppo business. And the first thing and the number one thing is I put them on WeChat, and then had them with have a like a roadshow. However, without a strategic planning, they probably don't understand where it's coming from. But if I give them background and also uh, what was happening in China and in the China big market, all of a sudden everything starts to make sense. So therefore, to answer your questions, I think you know, as the director uh, sitting on the board, you also need to have a direction where it's heading and also to have an open mind on what's coming.